Victorian Periodical Parade. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another Victorian Periodical Parade. This is part one. I wanted to ask, is this going to be a two-part episode? Because that story is quite a bit longer than all the other ones. And I'm wondering if the recording length for the story itself, how is that comparing to the other ones you've done? The one you sent me for this week is That Delightful Stranger. Oh, there we go. But Uh, it's like 25 pages when all the rest have been like 12. Right. Yeah, it's it might be a two parter because even the first episode that we put out was an hour and three minutes long, which was way over long, right? It was way over what we had wanted. And the problem for me is that I enjoyed all the stuff that I kept in. Mm -hmm. Um, But for clarity and maybe smoothness, it might be nicer to chop some of that out of the first episode. Because there are things in there where I'm like, well, we could take that out. Not many people would notice that it's gone. But, you know, I like it and, and we have good conversations about some of that stuff. And so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I know you listen to a lot of podcasts, too. And even though I love a good long story, right? I've started to get to the point where I kind of, I get a little disappointed at the outset if I see a podcast much longer than like 36 minutes, <laughs> because it's very rare that a host or a story really can be riveting enough to hold your attention for that length of time. But we've had 27 listens so far, so I don't know. It definitely depends. Okay, cool. Hey, is... Elsabeth at School Fjord now? No, she's completely out of Skoog. They said that she's just online. She was going to go to the site for a week. But mm-hmm. Now she's not going at all. So she's teaching Vidrogonda School online? Yeah, all the Vids are online. And there's a group of kids that are there for four weeks straight. So I think it's the Folkohoi School. And not the Vidrogonda? Yeah, well, because it's so much school. Yeah. Uh, but that's but- so depressing. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's no fun. That's for sure. But uh... yeah. So for those of you that might not know what the heck we're talking about and why it sounds like we're not speaking English through like one tenth of the sentence or paragraph, go back to the first episode and you'll get a full explanation. But basically, Owen and I have worked for many years at a Norwegian language immersion summer camp and it's camp season. And I don't know about you, but like, I'm always going to have like the nostalgias a little bit around June being yeah. like, I'm supposed to be at school for right now. Right. And like, if I'm not there, I have kind of recurrent dreams about it for the whole month. And Oh yeah, that's understandable. I was a lifeguard so often that I would go an extra week ahead of most everybody and I would go do lifeguard training. And so I was even there, it's like the last week of May. And so then in May, I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to be packing. And the first summer that I was not back to be a lifeguard, I was like, oh, this is weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like my brain cannot handle when I'm not there. Give me one second. I had to turn on this like (laughs) device and it won't turn on around a computer. Your cyborg parked? Yeah. <laughs> so you have, do they call it a stint that goes into your leg? I think it's an electrode. Okay. Oh, right, because it hits a nerve. Yeah. Come on. Sorry. No, it's fine. I really thought I could just do this simply, get it done while we're talking. My grandma has the pacemaker that stabilizes her heart. Uh huh. So yeah, I totally know computer stuff and like the medical electronics. For the longest time, I couldn't figure out why it wouldn't work. I mean, frequently. And it was because my Apple watch oh. was on my hand. But it's almost like sometimes when it gets funky, like it's just going to be funky forever mm. until you like, I don't know. It's, there we go. There we go. You can do it. There we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So listeners are just gonna have to be subjected to a bit of school fjord and talk from us because that's just what happens. And I have to say, so two years ago, so Owen's wife and I were high school campers there together. And then we worked together. And I mean, we all lived together briefly in Norway. 
But two years ago, I finally brought my two daughters up there, which is a really big deal. We're all very indoctrinated in the Norwegian camp. It's like a big stinking deal when you bring your kids the first time. And Owen and his wife's kids were there. And our two elder girls, the two younger kids were pretty much too young to do much of anything. But the two older girls were just thick as thieves. Mm -hmm. And it was so, you know, as parents and as people who had met when we were 13 and 16, just like warmed our hearts. And so my husband and I had decided like, we're going to do that every summer. We're just going to bring them. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be basically like our lake house escape before we can afford a lake house. (laughs) And then COVID happened and it's kind of broken my heart a little bit because I wanted this to be Flora's first summer, like in a program. Yeah, And I'm sure Elsabet was thinking of the same things. I mean, they're both old enough now. Yeah, they could have done the day camps. Yeah. And the reason I didn't decide to go at all is because, I mean, particularly my husband and I were both teachers. We've been doing the hybrid thing all year. And I'm so burnt out from hybrid teaching. I just... And also, I mean, Owen knows this, like I'm not really outdoorsy and Norwegians really are. And so like, it's already like a huge sacrifice that I'm going out in nature at all. So like, and then you put me out in nature and then you tell me I also have to be on Zoom. It's like the worst of both worlds for me. So I just couldn't, but I am like mourning the absence of it. Yeah. I'd really like to be able to like, we're going on a big road trip and I'd like to be able to like drive by and like pop in for the day. But then I realized like with the restrictions right now, that's not possible. It's not possible. But if you're coming anywhere near uh, Minnesota, you know, just drive by and, and stop and say hi. So this story was a super different one. Um, yeah, it was well, but it was also very similar to like a Sherlock Holmesy detective kind of thing, because there were people who were like, "Huh, that's weird. He's weird. Who is he?" And then the end was very Sherlock Holmesy. Right. Yeah, but it's like everything so far. Like I feel like we've gotten to know Lucy Hardy as an author so far, and everything else has been supernatural. Yeah, and that's this true. Is the yeah. most mundane of natural. Right things yeah i was waiting for the for the ghost again Mm -hmm. and it's kind of interesting that it's twice as long being about ordinary events like my gut might be like well supernatural story has to be a little bit longer because it's spooky and it's uncertain and you don't know what's happening but it's interesting to me that she took a more mundane plot and i don't think this is a spoiler i think it's really dang obvious from the beginning like a really mundane plot about a thief yeah and it's like twice as long <laughs> yeah it's like huh but again it might be something similar to getting to know her neighborhood where she lived and grew up and stuff because it was telling a lot about that town Yeah, and I don't know where she was from. Right, exactly. I'm sure the the editor might know. The editor, Johnny Maines, got in touch with me after I put out the first episode. And he was like, well, her birth name is actually Hart. So H-A-R-D-T. And so he was like, it's not that far of a stretch to go to Hardy. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, you mentioned something, I think, without even realizing how important it was. But you mentioned that it's a little bit more like Sherlock Holmesy, And this actually would have been, I believe, one year after the first Sherlock Holmes story came out. Well, that's what I was thinking. You had said the years in the other episode. And so I was like, well, maybe she's trying to jump on that bandwagon too, since she jumped on Thomas Hardy. Um, And we've talked about her doing all the sort of I mean, she's a very standard writer. I think we've talked about that. Like she's doing the standard ghost story tradition and this and that. And so turns out Sherlock Holmes debuted in 1892. I could have sworn it was 1895. Hmm. So she's a little bit after, but it was wildly popular. Um, I think everybody knows the story that he tried to kill the character off, that the fans wouldn't allow it. (laughs) It Wildly, wildly, wildly popular. So she's definitely, as you say, she's done with other styles. She's building on that literary Mm -hmm. tradition. Mm -hmm. 
So the other thing that's really interesting, so I don't know if you noticed this after all we've been talking about with ghost stories, that this is from the Christmas edition of a journal. It says the Belgravia Christmas Annual. Nice. Belgravia was a very famous journal or magazine, and we'll go over that. But this is the Christmas edition. Mm -hmm. Did you stop and wonder about it not being a ghost story since ghost stories are the tradition? Uh, Not really after but because it was a christmas edition i was expecting a ghost story and i was like ready for the ghost but then after having read the other one that was a christmas story and it wasn't a ghost story i was like okay well she's she's which one wasn't a ghost story well the first one with the purse of gold and then the robbers looking in through the window but she thought it was a ghost and there was this like folklore about it right all right out the window it looked like a ghost Right. Right. So this is, um, I've never quite described the shift in this way, but you could. As I said, Sherlock Holmes um, emerged in 1892, and he was, as I said, super popular. But he's also detective fiction. In the 1860s, you have something called sensation fiction. And it's basically the Victorian version of a psychological thriller. You don't know who is who. There's a lot of body snatching, body swapping, faked identity, forged letters. By the 1890s, when the detective novel comes up, and make no mistake, the sensation novel always has somebody who's solving the mystery, but they're not technically a detective. Hmm. The detective story with like a series of expectations that the reader would be trained to have in the genre, that begins with Sherlock Holmes. So I mean like short little story, mystery, smart dude comes and explains every point in it for you by the end. And it's all wrapped up with a neat little bow. The detective fiction that comes about 30 years after the sensation novels tends to be less about being spooky and scary and more about a very almost, I mean, what we all recognize in every crime and really even like medical procedural. So like Grey's Anatomy, House, NCIS, Mm. CSI, they're all so beholden to the Sherlock Holmes pattern. Yeah. And it's very, um, it's almost rote or systematic the way each of these stories mm-hmm. works. And it's informed so much of our storytelling today. And so this story falls in that tradition. And I think it's very interesting that she's doing that in the Christmas moment, which traditionally should be the time that we're actually thinking more about like spooky, unclear things instead of things that are very clear cut, earthly, rational explanations. So it almost feels to me as the century is winding up to its conclusion. And indeed, this period is called the Fantasiac, which means the end of the cycle. And it speaks to its own literary tradition you're seeing literature that is more bleak, but also just serious, scientific and technologically minded. And so you get these like hyper rational characters and plots Uh like Sherlock Holmes. And so it's almost feels here like she's kind of making this really almost edgy point. Like I almost would say this is the edgiest she's ever been (laughs) by swapping what the reader would be expecting to be a ghost story because it's in the Christmas edition. Yeah. And making it sort of just a cold humdrum, like dude needed money, dude took the money. That's all there was to it story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can believe it. But then what I got from it was that edge of creepiness that some dude could just come in and and take what he wanted with just a name, right? And so there is creepiness and mystery, but like there's no straight line of death. Because his mother was in the house, in the manor, all by herself, usually. Yeah, no, you're right. And and this goes back to ways that I think, you know, Lucy Hardy is honestly just a really good case study of your average Victorian story. Because the main preoccupying fear or paranoia in the 1860s suspense novel, sensation novels, mm-hmm. is the inability to know for sure who mm-hmm. anyone is. Right. So actually, like, there's this way in which I feel like she's kind of making this, like, claim, and she's being edgy, and she's like, no, I'm not going to do the Christmas thing. I'm doing this thing. Mm -hmm. 
But she's also doing that based on sort of cultural anxieties that were 35 years old at this point. But they're really fun to talk about. They're really akin, they're sort of the Victorian parallel of our modern day paranoias of surveillance and data collection. Right. But they're kind of the opposite. So in the 1860s, you have cities growing at rapid rates and- fewer and fewer people living in towns where everybody knew everybody. So it's kind of this, you know, for most of history, people lived in these small villages and all of a sudden that's not the case anymore. And so those demographic changes were happening at a rate that far outpaced society's ability to do anything about it. And so it's not like now where, you know, I have a passport or you have a social security number. They didn't have that. And so there was this reasonable, concern that people could just claim whoever they wanted to be. And so the literature of the 1860s is all about that. Like two people look alike and we swap their bodies or this person steals a letter off a dead girl that says like, because this is basically all you could do is like, I could go to school, Jordan, with a letter from you and be like, Owen knows who I am. None of y'all remember me, but like, you know, Owen and Owen wrote me this letter saying I am who I say I am. So like you have stories where people steal those letters off of people and Mm -hmm. like impersonate them. And in this story, aside from her dabbling in these very well-known fears of identity and the uncertainty of people being who they are, what you really see also in this story, and it was almost endearing in a way, because she's very clearly making fun of the viewpoint of the narrator. Mm. And that viewpoint represents a very particular sort of Victorian class bias. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's not just, you know, we don't like other classes. What what was happening again in the mid-century, the 1860s, the reason cities were growing, of course, is because of industrialization. Industrialization also meant that for the first time in British history, people could essentially socially climb through hard work and pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. Mm. You have to understand that for most of British history before the 1800s, class was lineage based. It was not economically based. So you would often have like lords and ladies who were bankrupt. But they're still a lord. Yes. Yes. And so you almost have to think like if you kept up at all, I haven't that much uh, with the Meghan Markle, Prince Harry thing. Um, I watched the Oprah special, but like she said, because apparently Meghan Markle is like was an actress. I didn't really know that. But she's um, an American actress. Yeah. She really felt like, well, I'm essentially American royalty. Like I'm a celebrity. So it's fine. They're like a British celebrity. And she really found out that like to this day, no. Like you didn't have the lineage they wanted. Of course, for them, that was very race based. Um, Cousin based too. (laughs) Yeah, there was all this nonsense. And so you can only imagine, you know, 150 years ago, they were very class based. But it's really hard for us as Americans, because from pretty much the development of the American colonies, they were by definition breaking from those traditions and lineages. So in America, it's always been economic standing. Yep. And even in Victorian novels, you'll kind of see them say that, like, well, you have these sort of like slack jawed yokels that are millionaires over there and the British didn't really trust it because they were like, well, anybody can make money, but like they don't have class, which for them was breeding and bloodlines. So what you're seeing in the story, because of the urbanization in the mid century, There were more and more people that were suddenly able to live like they were upper class. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Because they had the money to afford the things. Yeah. But the British aristocracy, who by bloodlines had always been upper class, I mean, that there was nothing more threatening. Um, If you've ever read The Great Gatsby, even though that's American, it's a good parallel of like old versus new money. And that's what it is. So she's being like really parodic in the way she's talking about how awful these new rich people are and how amazing the narrator and their upper class circle is, even though all the aristocracy in this town was pretty poor. (laughs) Yeah, it's really funny as far as richness. It's definitely that heritage and is all family houses on the beach and it's really pretty area as it's described but no one is going to sell their land to somebody from the city exactly and this is all about that sort of 
protection of class. And she makes it pretty clear here that part of the threat is that like, if all you've ever had is that you were a baron, but you were bankrupt, somebody who comes in that doesn't have that lineage, but has more money than you. Yeah. It's all kind of imaginary, right? Like the baron only has status if he has no money. There's only status because they all agreed that that counted. Right. Yeah. It's like this house of cards. And so if people come in with actually more money than you and can do more fashionable things than you, then that actually literally threatens any claim you have to anything in society because all you had was your name basically Mm -hmm. yep and so with this stranger coming in and misguiding people about his identity it's playing both on a very age-old fear about people being able to do that but also sort of do you see how it kind of plays on the same paranoia that like any old person can now waltz in with money and do whatever they want and our whole class system is going to crumble he plays on that class anxiety a lot too yeah it's like who's this person coming in to disrupt our normal right break it up and make it whatever he wants now because now he's the big dog in town right yeah and you could see even when they they meet the daughter that has the watch mr horrocks's daughter flora Mm -hmm. um yeah that's cool (laughs) well you know flora was the number one most popular girl's name in the 1880s and 1890s and that's why i picked it for flora because those are my decades that i study isn't her full name florence Yes. And you know, those are actually two different root names. Flora is not short for Florence. No. Yeah, I reject that. Because I think Flora should be short for Florence. And I don't know why it's not. So I just went with both. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Flora was a super popular name. So it's not actually very coincidental to find it because like I picked it specifically because it was so common back then. But it's nice. It's a good name. Yeah. But yeah, when they find her with uh, Caroline's stolen watch, they actually say that like Flora Horrocks thinks it's kind of garbage. Like she has much nicer jewelry at home and she's only wearing it because her boyfriend gave it to her. Yes. So that goes to demonstrate like we don't know one way or the other, but it could be that Caroline's family doesn't have money to give her nice jewelry. Right. Her uncle is the rector and, you know, rectors could do okay, but they, they're they never going to be fantastically wealthy. Right. In fact, the parson or the, the village priest, rector, curate, whatever you want to call it, those would be given just basically a stipend for life to go live right. in a village and be the pastor. And they were kind of the one exception that they were always allowed in the upper crust circle, even though they may not have the lineage yeah. or the income, because it was just kind of like respectable, you know, they're right. the pastor. So yeah, it's very possible that, you know, their family doesn't actually have the money at all to compete with the belongings and material wealth of the Horrockses. And I think that kind of comes through in the watch moment when her Flora's dad says, oh no, like normally her watch has pearls all over the back of it. And Mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely an interesting scenario because it's like, why would she accept it if it's so below her, but then it's from her boyfriend, but why would he give something so meager to someone who has so much money? It's very quizzical. Well, and I think he said, like, well, it was my dead sister. So, like, I only like oh. it because it's sentimental. So he threw another lie on top of it and said, well, it's nothing, but it's special. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the Q99 thing was cool. Like, I guess that's like a serial number, like an early yeah. form of a serial number. Yeah. It's either a serial number or just straight up, well, this is the 99th watch that Q made. Because like with sterling silver also in Britain, they would put the maker's stamp on everything and another number and everything. And so it's another trade naming convention where, yeah, this is from a highly reputable person. And then, of course, it trickles down into every watchmaker in case that one day they sell their watch to the queen. (laughs) Right. Well, I thought it was interesting, too, that when Caroline finds the serial number that she had written down, she said, I should have remembered it because it's all the same figures, Q99. And you can almost see how, like, a nine could look like a Q. Especially in cursive. Yeah, that's what I almost wanted to see, like, because handwriting and script goes in styles, Yeah, depending on how you teach your children. It made me want to look at how Victorians were writing their cues at that time, right. that it would look similar enough to a nine. Mm-hmm. Oh, a lowercase lower case. Q. 
Yeah, yeah. lowercase q looks just like a nine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. It's interesting that they would publish it then with the capital. Yeah, exactly. It's like, huh. I didn't look up any specific stuff from the journal this week because Belgravia is the first one we've really come across that I know a lot about on my own. Nice. And so instead of just finding random miscellany in Belgravia, I thought I would bring tell your favorite you to the table. It. I always want to double check. Yes. So Belgravia was founded and run by a female Victorian novelist named Mary oh, Elizabeth yeah. Braddon. Wait, oh, really? Yes, 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 oh. of course. There's, yeah, Lady Aldi's Secret. Oh, man. Yeah. Thanks again for tuning in to the Victorian Periodical Parade, part two, coming soon. Have a great day. See ya. Victorian Periodical Parade Victorian Periodical Parade